The Tailor of Gloucester. In the time of suits and periwig, and full skirted coat with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold laced waistcoats of padusoy and taffeta, there lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snipped it, piecing out his satin and pompadour and lute string. Steph's had strange names and were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbours, he himself was very, very poor. A little old man in spectacles with a pinched face. Old crooked fingers, and a suit of threadbare cloth. He cut his coats without waste, according to his embroidered cloth. They were very small ends and snippets that lay about upon the table. Too narrow breadth for naught, except waistcoat for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat. A coat of cherry coloured coated silk, embroidered with pansies and roses, and a cream coloured satin waistcoat, trimmed with gauze and green worsted chenille, for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked, and he took to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round. And trimmed it into shape with his seas. The table was all littered with cherry coloured snippets. No breath at all, and cut on the cross. It is no breath at all. Tippets for a mice, and ribbons for a mops for a mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. When the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes, And shut out the light. The tailor has done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out upon the table. There were twelve pieces for the coat, and four pieces for the waistcoat. And there were pocket flaps and cuffs, and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat, there was fine yellow taffeta. And for the buttonholes of the waistcoat, there was cherry-coloured twist. And everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient. Except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-coloured twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at night. He fastened the window and locked the door and took away the key. No one lived there at night, but little brown mice, and they ran in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trapdoors, and the mice run from house to house. Through those long narrow passages, they can run over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of his shop, and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite near by in College Court, next the doorway to College Green. And although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor, he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called sinking. Now all day long, while the tailor was out at work, sinking kept house by himself, and he also was fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. <coughs> Said the cat when the tailor opened the door. <coughs> the tailor replied, "Sinking, we shall make our fortune." But I am worn to a raveling. Take this groat, which is our last fourpence, and simkin. Take china picking by a pennyworth of bread. 
a penworth of milk, and a penworth of sausages, and oh, thinking with the last penny of four pence by me, one penworth of cherry-coloured silk, but do not lose last penny of the four pence, thinking, or I am undone and want to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then thinking again, said. And took the rod and the pikin, and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth, and talked to himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat. To be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta sufficeth. There is no more left over in snippets than will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started, for suddenly, interrupting him, from the dresser at the other side of the kitchen, came a number of little noises. Now, what can that be? Said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pickings, willow pattern plates, and tickets and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen, and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening, and peering through his spectacles. Again, from under a teacup, came those funny little noises. This is very peculiar," said the tailor of Gloucester. And he lifted up the teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse, and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down of the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands, and. Mumbling to himself, the waistcoat is cut off from peach-coloured satin, tambour stitch, and rosebuds in beautiful floss silk. Was I wise to interest my last four pounds to Simkin, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured twist? But all at once, from the dresser. There came other little noises. This is passing extraordinary," said the tailor of Gloucester. And turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse and made a bow to the tailor. And then, from all over the dresser, came a chorus of little tappings. All sounding together, and answering one another, like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. And out from under teacups and from under bowls and basins, stepped other and more little mice, who hopped away down of the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down, close over the fire. Lamenting, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured silk, to be finished by noon of Saturday, and this is Tuesday evening. Was it right to let loose those mice, undoubtedly the property of Simkin? Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again, and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining, and about little mouse tippets. And then, all at once, they all ran away together down the passage behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another, as they ran from house to house. And not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen, 
when Simkin came back with the pipkin of milk. Simkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry <laughs> like a cat that is vexed, for he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears and snow in his collar at the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. Simkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simkin sat down the pipkin of milk upon the dresser and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of little fat mouse. Simkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simkin had been able to talk, he would have asked, Where is my mouse? Alack, I am undone, said the tailor of Gloucester and went sadly to bed. All that night long, Simkin hunted and searched through the kitchen, peeping into cupboards and under the wainscot, and into the teapot where he had hidden that twist, but still he found never a mouse. Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simkin sat and made strange horrid noises as cats do at night. For the poor old tailor was very ill with a fever, tossing and turning in his four-post bed. And still in his dreams he mumbled, No more twist, no more twist. All that day he was ill, and the next day, and the next. And what should become of the cherry-coloured coat? In the tailor's shop in Westgate Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay cut out upon the table, one and twenty buttonholes. And who should come to sew them, when the window was barred and the door was fast locked? But that does not tinder the little brown mice. They run in and out without any keys through all the old houses in Gloucester. Out of doors the market folks went drowsing through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there would be no Christmas dinner for Simkin and the poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights, and then it was Christmas Eve, and very late at night. The moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys, and looked down over the gate into College Court. There were no lights in the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the city of Gloucester was fast asleep under the snow. And still Simkin wanted his mice, and he mewed as he stood beside the four-post bed. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning. Though there are very few folk that can hear them or know what it is that they say. When the cathedral clock struck twelve, there was an answer, like an echo of the chimes. And Simkin heard it and came out of the tailor's door and wandered about in the snow. From all the roofs and gables and old wooden houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices singing the old Christmas rhymes, all the old songs that ever I heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittington's bells. First and loudest the cooks cried out, Damn! Get up and bake your pies. Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simkin. And now in the garret, there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, 
all the cats in Gloucester except me," said Simkin. Under the wooden leaves, the starling and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower. And although it was the middle of the night, the throstles and robins sang. The air was quite full of little twittering tunes. But it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simkin. Particularly, he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind a wooden lattice. I think that they were bats, because they always have very small voices, especially in a black frost, when they talk in their sleep, like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious, that sounded like, "Buzz," quoth the blue fly, "Hum," quoth the bee, "Buzz and hum," they cry, and so do we. And Simkin went away, shaking his ears as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Westgate came a glow of light, and. When Simkin crept up to peep in at the window, it was full of candles. There was a snippeting of scissors and snippeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang loudly and gaily. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little kyla cow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all in now. Then, without a pause, the little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oatmeal, grind my lady's flour. Put it in a chestnut, let it stand an hour. <coughs> Interrupted Simkin, and he scratched at the door, but the key was under the tailor's pillow. He could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin. Push passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fire little man? Making coats for a gentleman. Shall I come in and cut off your dread? Oh no, Miss Push, you'd bite off our heads! <coughs> cried Simkin. Hey, diddle dinkity! Answered the little mice. Hey, diddle dinkity! Popati pat! The merchants of London they were scarlet, silk in the colour and gold in the hem. So merrily marched the merchantmen. They clicked their thimbles to mark the time, but none of those songs pleased Simkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop, and then. I bought a pipkin and a popkin, a slipkin and a slopkin, all for one farthing, and opened the kitchen dresser. Added the rude little mice. <coughs> Scuffled sinking on the window sill. While the little mice inside sprang to their feet, and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices. No more twist. No more twist. And they barred up the window shutters, and shut out Simkin. Whilst he drew the nicks in the shutters, he could hear the click of thimble, and little mouse voices sing. No more twist. No more twist. Simkin came away from the shop, and went home, considering in his mind. He found the poor old tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully. Then Simkin went on tiptoe and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot, and looked at it in the moonlight. And he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw, upon the patchwork quilt, was a skein of cherry-coloured twisted silk. And beside his bed stood the repentant Simkin. Alack, 
I am one to a raveling, said the tailor of Gloucester, but I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed, and came out into the street with Simkin running before him. The starring whistled on the chimney stack, and the throstles and robins sang, but they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength, nor time, than will serve to make me one single buttonhole. For this is Christmas Day in the morning, the mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon, and where is his cherry-coloured coat? He unlocked the door of little shop in Westgate Street, and sinking ran in, like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boots were swept and clean, the little ends of thread and the little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There, where he had left plain cuttings of silk, there lay the most beautifulest coat and embroidered satin waistcoat that ever were worn by a mayor of Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the facing of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except just one single cherry-coloured buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting, there was pinned a scrap of paper with these words and little teeny weeny writing. No more twist. And from then began the lack of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout, and he grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoat for all the rich merchants of Gloucester, and for all the fine gentlemen of the country round. Never was seen such ruffles or such embroidered cuffs and lappets. But his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of it all. The stitches of those buttonholes were so neat, so neat. I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles, with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small, so small, they looked as if they had been made by little mice.